grade is the first year, hello, I care a little. <laughs> I can jump right in. Um, recognize most of you, but again, I'm the math coordinator. I have been doing fractions with parents for about a week now. And it's very interesting because usually it's, it's just hit that I do the youngest grade and then the next and the next. And this one I've done backwards. So I started with multiplying and dividing fractions and then went to adding. And now I'm down to third grade that is about understanding fractions. So we're going to play with some things. I'm also going to assume that it may have been a while since you've dealt with fractions formally. I know you use fractions in everyday life. I know you use halves, maybe thirds, probably fourths, and really that's what we stick with in third grade also. We don't try to do exotic, weird ones to, to make sure they're understanding. We give them real life ones so that they can build that knowledge and then apply it later, although I've never had to use thirteenths in my life. Although I did so as a child and we used five eighths all the time. I don't know why. But to begin with, let's go over some of the language of fractions. It's really important that we do start calling these things numerators and denominators. This information is all on your front, front page, first page, if you wanted to take notes. They're going to look pretty similar, but you don't have to write this all down. It's here for you. Um, the denominator, the way we help them understand is the D is also for down, it's the one on the bottom. So just to memorize what the word is, but the understanding of it is, the denominator is how many equal parts the whole is cut into, and the numerator is how many of those equal parts you get. We do talk about that language, we do not test the kids on it, but it's easier to communicate if you're using the proper language. Um, one of the biggest and most important things that your children will be required to understand and express and be able to communicate. That we can only compare fractions that are of equal, well, fractions are equal parts of a whole. It's not that we're just dividing it into three pieces. That seems simplistic when you've got it like this, but you start putting stories into account and you have to remember this fact. Um, we're going to be dealing with holes. Your kids will be dealing and working with more than one. So if we have four fourths equals a whole, eight fourth is four plus, four fourths plus four fourths would be two holes. They will be talking that way. We will be, you may have learned that term is an improper fraction. There are times when it makes sense to use improper fractions. That title itself is slowly going away. We're still using it because we don't really have another name for it. An improper fraction means that the numerator is greater than the denominator, which means you're above one whole. You will be seeing number lines. You will be playing with number lines today where we, we are adding up to greater than a whole. Um, any whole number can be re represented as a fraction. This is what I was just referring to. We will be using number lines that count up and keep going to different ones. They're learning this by building it and by using strips and by using a number line. We are not doing any multiplying and dividing to get them there. Kids with good numeracy will start seeing, well, that's this is 3 thirds plus 3 thirds. We want them understanding that it's two groups of three thirds, but we're never turning it into an algorithm of how to find it by multiplication. This is one of the cornerstones of understanding fractions, is what does that denominator do for the size of our piece? So one half is one over two, when we increase the number of the denominator, one over three, it means we have three pieces of that whole. By looking at it, what happens to the size of the piece? It went from here to here, so it got smaller. When it went from one third to one fourth, it gets smaller. The number itself is actually getting larger. The kids understand it when they see it like this, but when they don't have that full grasp, that full understanding, they can lose it again. So this is one area we know is a common area for them to make mistakes. So when a child is making a mistake or having trouble explaining things, that's what I'll look. Is, is he 
or she doing that? Because that's easy enough to bring the picture back up and say, okay, let's look at this again. And when they understand this, there's ways of using logic to start comparing fractions. The size of the fractional part is relative to the whole. You're going to see language all unit. And this unit, for most of you, the kids aren't even starting the unit till Wednesday, Thursday of this week. So I doubt that you've even seen fractions yet. Um, this is another cornerstone of fractions. You have to be comparing the same whole. And we will be very picky about that communication during this unit. Um, because <laughs> this half is considerably more pizza than this three fourths. Obviously, if they were the same size pizza, three-fourths would be larger than one-half. We have to make sure we're comparing the same thing. I should say the same thing, the same whole. So that is going to be required in a lot of their communication. They may have to say it. They may have to make sure they're writing where their whole is so that they understand that we're comparing like sizes. <laughs> I don't like my own slides. Um, they'll be doing some adding, but they'll also be doing a lot of comparing. We don't really use circles much anymore, mostly because we can't draw them well. And we're going to be playing with seven system strips, with um, strips to show that. And we'll see how easily it is so much easier to deal with a rectangular than a circle. Rectangle. Also, these miraculously coincide lovely with the tape diagram that we've been teaching them for two years. So we are doing things purposely to lead into one another. Now, if a child draws this for me and, and does a reasonable job, I don't expect perfection. I'm going to accept this because it does prove what they're saying. But if a child can't draw it accurately, I mean, we, we, we don't expect perfection, but we do expect reasonableness. So we push most kids away from circles because they're just too hard to do. And it's very hard to compare something if you haven't drawn it well. And at this point, the conceptual understanding, the drawings are very important. Fractions, even among teachers, if you ask them, it's a toss up. Would you rather do fractions, word problems, or go to the dentist? They're all about loved, about the same amount. Um, if any of you have older kids, my husband teaches seventh grade. He wants, I think he's got them embrace the fractions. I mean, he's got a whole logo. Fractions are numbers. They work the same way as whole numbers. We need to quit thinking them as this evil entity. We need to just accept, okay, they have, you know, they follow the same patterns. They look a little bit different, but it's okay. Because like actually we're now teaching them so much of how much they do respond just like whole numbers. One of the areas that we've gotten better in teaching is using the number line because they are numbers and we want them to see them as a whole number. When we only compare areas and see it as pictures, they don't always see how they break apart just like another number. And you're going to see what we do today in the number bonds, how we can use what we already know about whole numbers and um, convert that to fractions. So that math is not brand new every single year. We're actually using, building upon what we know. Um, and this is the foundation year for fractions. I mean, they did a little bit with equal pieces last year and, and just recognizing things, but really this is the year that we start off, that they have their own category of standards. Does that make sense? All rings a bell. Uh, as I said, We'll be going over the rest of the things on this piece. So let's move in and start. I didn't give myself any fraction strips. Would you please start where I'm going to be picky about the colors. Would you take a blue strip? I'm going to show you a couple of blue strips and yellow strips. First off, what do you notice about them? Yes, they're blue and yellow. They're equal. Thank you. Um, so we are starting with strips of the same size. If you need more, can you grab them? I just kind of threw some on the tables. Am I thinking on your yellows? <laughs> you need three blue and two yellow. Any more? No. Okay. So we're
we're starting off. This is our hole. If we fold it in half, essentially equal size and I can label them. I have one half here and one half here. So I take your next one, next blue one, and fold it in half. But I want to break that one half into two pieces. So I'm going to fold it again. This language is important with the kids, so we're breaking it in half of two pieces or making each piece into two pieces. Just so they understand it, I'm not equating it back to any multiplication. So how many pieces did we end up with? So I can label each one. I can now start making comparisons. I can now start asking questions. How many fourths are there in one whole? How many fourths are there in one half? Two. Okay. We do go beyond fourths. If I fold it in half, I get halves. If I fold that again, I get fourths. Fold it again. How many pieces do we get? Now, as you can imagine, if we went to draw this, the common mistake is that a child's going to take it and draw eight lines. That's how, how, how many folds there actually are. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven folds. That gives you eight pieces. Um, so there's always one last line. That's not a huge mathematical error. It's a typical drawing error. So if you're drawing six, you draw five lines in there. If you're drawing 40 seconds, you would draw 41 lines, which we would never ask them to do. Okay? We, do, we work with halves, fourths, and eighths a lot. Would you turn and talk to somebody at your table? I want you to ask them a question that they can solve by looking at their three scripts. I'll tell you, asking the question is is more solidifying for knowledge than answering the question. Yeah, because it has to be answerable. Do you have been a hobby? How many eights are there in? Well, I'm asking you, I didn't finish the sentence. How, how many eights? Have you looked here? How many eights are in? So you're going to ask for that. Oh, I'm going to talk to you about that. How many eights are there? How many eights are there? Is that right? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Right. Okay. Who will share one question? <laughs> See if I can answer it. <laughs> Somebody ask me a question. Yes. How many eights do you have in half? Yeah, how many eights do I have in half? Can I answer that looking at these strips? Absolutely. I can move them if I even have to. So I've got four eights. You can make these strips obviously out of anything at home as soon as you're having a problem. We're going to see about drawing them quickly. But sometimes we need to go back. Yeah, that AC's on now. <laughs> okay. The hardest day in fractions, honestly, is about folding a third. <laughs> um, I've done it a lot. Um, I'll try to do it under here. 
here. Thirds, to me, you start by going past a half, and then you curl it under, and then I kind of look at the rounded sides, and I get close. I get close enough that it looks like thirds.
What fraction of the original pie does each <coughs> piece represent? Which fraction strip are we going to use? Eight. We're going to do eights. I draw my fraction strip, I cut it in half. I cut those in half again, I get fourths. I cut those in half again, I get eights. And this equals one. What fraction of the original pie does each represent? I'm not sure whether you'd write it here or if you'd label it. And would you answer B? We work with word problems. We do have them write an answering statement because the question could have said, How much did he eat in total? The answer would have been three eighths. How much did he have left? There was not eaten. It was five eighths. So after we do the mathematical part of it, we do need to make sure we're answering the correct answer or correct question. Yep. Uh, so when you ask the question of the increase in the fraction, do you just require the uh, where the eat is all the fraction and then just write the answer? They don't need an equation to show how they got that. Not at this point. Yeah. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna roll along here. And what I've only shown you this, this is a copy of the strip that they've made. We call it a bar diagram. I'm going to show you how to use uh, number bonds. But at this point, it, it's really just getting them thinking about the fractions. We kind of have the classic shading and not shading. I'd like to go back to a little bit of language. Um, I've been talking about fourths. Um, especially in the U.S., we use the term quarters. It's based on our money. 25 cents of the dollar, the, the name of it is a quarter. I think other people use it also. Um, we go back and forth. It, this is an English, predominantly English curriculum, or American curriculum, so we want kids to be aware of it. I would say we try to use one fourth, but it's okay that we go back and forth. And I would, if somebody didn't understand me, I would always correct it, or not correct it, but tell them what the equivalence is. So um, we're not trying to trick somebody with that, but we do want them. To, we do want to expose them that sometimes they have a little bit different names. And um, I'm trying to think, other than a quarter and a half, is, I don't have any other names. Thirds. I think it's only fourths that we have that other name for. Um, so it's, we're never trying to do a gotcha, you didn't know it. Um, but we also don't want to not expose them and then they go out in the real world and somebody uses it. So we want them to have that flexibility of using both, both words. I mean, it, I'm gonna kind of assume we can do the shaded unshaded. <laughs> um, and move on. I, I'm just looking at the clock. These are examples for you to play with. You can see how the unit is progressing by looking at those questions. So I want to get to the number bond. Um, your kids, if you were here since at least first grade, they've been using number bonds. A number bond is a way to represent part, part, whole. We say part, part, whole because that's what we mean. It can be part, 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 whole. We're not tied to just two. So I wanted to show you these. These are just taking you back to first and second grade where we broke numbers apart. Often we break them apart by place value because that helps us. Sometimes it helps us to break them apart into friendly numbers. This is out of context. We have no idea why those were chosen. In fractions, we often want to break them down into what is called a unit fraction. Unit means it is one piece of how many ever it was cut into. So one half, one fourth, 
one eighth, one tenth. Those are all unit fractions. We want the kids to have, be nimble with being able to break any fraction down into unit fractions. Because later on, when they're adding and subtracting, that can be a very easy way to help them subtract instead of regrouping and everything. So it's just another tool that they can have. So if we're looking at unit fractions, if we want to break this one into two parts, that immediately tells us the denominator. It has to be two. And I have one of each, and that makes my whole. If I'm breaking it into three parts, my denominator is going to be thirds. So you can kind of think of this as addition problems. One third plus one third plus one third equals one. But we don't always have unit fractions. That's I'm teaching you vocabulary. We have non-unit fractions. Um, so if one, if I wanted to break it into a non-unit fraction, I could do, well, I could do two-thirds, which is a non-unit, plus one-third, which is a unit, but I've not broken them into equal pieces. What else could you break this one into? Three-eighths and five-eighths. Three-eighths and five-eighths. What else could we break it into? Two-fourths and two-fourths. Two-fourths and two-fourths. This is just an exercise to help you understand the language. I mean, you could do three-fourths and one-fourths. We're never going to ask them to just break it apart with non-unit fractions. But we do want them to see these different ways of being able to break apart holes. So let's put it into action. Aiden put one-fourth of the meat on the grill. He put the rest in the refrigerator. Draw a number bond showing the fraction of the meat on the grill and the fraction in the refrigerator. Well, we've got to be talking about all of the meat, which is a whole. We don't know whether we're talking pounds, kilos. It doesn't matter. We know we have one part of the meat. We have one fourth on the grill. How much would go in the refrigerator? And you can see how I'm labeling it. I, I just want to know what they're thinking. I don't have to write out refrigerator. I don't have to write out grill. It's obvious what they're saying. But I do want to see the understanding of the story. Can you do, show me what Jasmine ate? Or show your partner what Jasmine ate and how much was left. And 
this was left. So I'm marching through the unit the way your kids are going to see it. I'm teaching you the part that might come home and you look at it and say, I'm not quite sure what the teacher wants. I may be able to figure it out, but what do I think you know? So some of this is kind of standalone stuff, like this next one. Double number bonds are more of a puzzle or a game, but they can explain a story, but your kids will be practicing them. So if I wanted to break this up, I could do one-fourth and three-fourths. I could then break up that three-fourths into two-fourths and one-fourth. And I could keep going. I don't know what the story would be, but you can get them down to unit fractions. I'm not saying that's what we're doing, but you could have a story that went along. In fact, you and your partner, <laughs> come up with a story, don't do this part, that would match this double number bond. I'll tell you, leftover food works well. <laughs> and really, who leaves leftover pizza? I do. I mean, it's the next day for breakfast. I guess I do. look like and what would that look like on a number line? Label this, but somewhere I make sure that we know. 
no, we're talking about two thirds. And on a number line, it's usually a dot. On a bar diagram, it's usually shading. I still see the thirds, but I understand that the, the whole was broken into two amounts. <coughs> Ribbon is one meter long. Ms. Lewis wants to sew a bead every one fifth meter. The first bead is at one fifth meter. The last bead is at the one meter mark. Draw and label a number line, zero to one, and then sew on the beads. So would you go ahead and use your number line to show your understanding of this problem? We do start having questions that may not start at zero. I see it well up there, but I can see it on my paper. This says we're starting at one. So what is my fraction of thirds at one? One third would be if we started at zero. If I'm starting at one, I already have three thirds. So we would then have four thirds, five thirds, and six thirds. I'm also going to tell you something about the labeling here. A lot of times this would be down here, and the reason we have the box above is because we have two different ways of writing it. It's I'm not sure it's right or wrong. It's a little bit out of habit. And I wasn't paying a lot of attention when I wrote that down. I think most kids, most number lines are lined, are counted underneath. But when you have, and you 
want to especially recognize that six thirds is the same as two. We've got the two on the bottom and the six thirds on the top. How long will they in a, like how long will fractions be in the classroom? Six weeks, five to six weeks. So for a measurement project in math class, students measured the lengths of their little fingers. Alex measured two inches long. Jeremiah's little finger was seven fourth inches long. Whose finger is longer? And prove it. Show your thinking. This particular one asked you to use a number line. How would you show and get the answer for whose finger is longer? Did you get that Alex's finger was longer? Two inches. Yes, two inches. I've proven it with a number line. I want to know what was important about the number lines that I drew. That it starts at one? No. Well, I guess it started with zero. Yeah, you have one step zero and the other one Well, I didn't label it, to be honest, I just didn't label it. What's important about the number lines? Yeah, I had to include fractions on Jeremiah's because that's the information I had. I didn't really have any way of converting it to anything else. What else is important? Yeah. Uh, can they use one number line to show this? Or they Absolutely. We could have, I don't know what you would say, which, I mean, I could have put these fourths up here and done exactly up here and then just made sure that I labeled that as Alex and this one as Jeremiah. I want to go back to the other two. And actually, her solution ensures We've got to make sure when we're comparing something that's of the same measurement, they're the same size. This goes back to my number line needed to, to line up one and one because we were comparing inches. They are the same size. We're going back to that idea of comparing the same thing. Because if a child was sloppy or didn't understand the value and drew his second one like this, and it is four fourths, and his seven fourths ended up over here, it could have looked longer. So we're still making sure we're, we're 
comparing the same thing, we're comparing the same measurement, so they have to align. This is back to that being equal sizes. If we just do it on one number line, and I'll be honest, the kids are gonna go both ways on that. There's gonna be some that would automatically do it on one, a little bit simpler because you know that your size stays the same. But some of them are seeing this story, I've got two kids, I've got two lines, both of them equally acceptable. So this unit is going to be a lot about these stories, making these comparisons, looking at them. They'll be adding, they'll be adding simple fractions. They'll be using the number lines to add them. That I don't think will look new to you at all. Um, as I said, it's going to start any day now. Teachers are within two or three days of each other. Um, I want to talk to you about multiplication before we leave. Your kids have done two full units on multiplication and a third one on area, which is really multiplication. So we've had lots of real life practice. They understand what multiplication is now. It is now time for them to start playing games and start getting down the facts to automaticity. I don't really mean flashcards in their face because there's no fun in that. Nobody wants to do that. I put up it doesn't matter. Multiple numbers of games here that are online, that are all free, that are fun games, and some of them quite clever as to get them knowing their multiplication facts fairly easily. Automaticity means I don't have to struggle to figure it out. It doesn't mean one second or two seconds. It does mean within four or five seconds, which is actually pretty long. If I say three times four, That's a fair amount of time to come up with 12. I wouldn't expect them for three times four. I would kind of expect them to say 12. Eight times eight, eight times seven, they may be using a strategy to get to those particular ones. Um, what we don't want to have them doing is all the hard work is going into figuring out that calculation when there's more of a problem to come. Um, there's a direct relationship into knowing their multiplication facts by the time they get to do fractions next year. They don't need it so much for here, but they need factors for next year. So now's the time to start playing. They've got the foundational skills. Um, these are fairly ugly URLs. If you go, excuse me, I'm pointing to the wrong thing. On my website, where is it? The ASD Parent Math Resources. I have a new way of getting there. It's just shorter. It's to the exact same site. Tiny URL is a website that just helps make those strings shorter. I just learned about it. What I'm, why I'm telling you this, if you go online, you can get this online, which means you could just click on these games. So I'm just, it's just an easier way. It's the exact same games, same information. Um, but if you feel like you have time, or it's a rainy day outside, these games are fun. I will not even tell you how long I played this game because I just found it fun. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a fun way. We know the brain learns better when you're relaxed and happy. It makes it into the long-term memory better. Um, your kids may not like all of them. They should find one that they like. There's also, for kids who already know them, one of them is about blocks. Like they've got tons of twos and threes and fours, and they say, how can you make 24? But they're actually encouraging you to multiply two times two times two times three, which that's a really great skill to have, to know how to factor it down. But another kid could do, what did I say, 24? Could do eight times three. I mean, they're all there. So they're, they come very leveled. Some of the games say, I don't know, 40, 48. And then they give you all these games that all different ways to get to 48. Some of them are about the facts. They're just, they're clever. They're just not straight drill and kill. Um, 10 minutes a day is going to do wonders. A lot better than an hour on a weekend. Um, and yes, you have permission to kick them off after they've been on there for a while. I'm not suggesting they should spend their life there. So those multiplications, now's the time we're starting to encourage it. What do you mean by extension sites? Pardon me? What do you mean by extension? Um, extension sites means they get all this. 
this is coming easily to them. What can I be doing with my child beyond this? These are more heading towards logic and spatial games. I mean, at some point we get it. We've got the fractions, we understand the depth of it. Drawing it's not gonna make any difference. Going to bigger or weirder numbers really does not enhance their understanding. There are areas that we just don't do much in school. And I, I would say logic and spatial reasoning. And these are those type um, this is just for their learning. This has nothing to do with the curriculum itself. This is, this is to make them a more flexible, creative mathematician. The last one that says Common Sense Media. This is a website that we recommend for absolutely everything you do with your child. It is a site that monitors all other sites. It will tell you if there are ads on the site. And I cannot guarantee whether there's ads or not. I mean, this came from a Bureau of Good Resource, but I can't guarantee that there are not ads on those first ones. I didn't think about that until now. Um, when your kids grow up, you quit caring about the ads as much. Um, so Common Sense Media is there. You could, you could go to it and then put in multiplication facts. I think they have 312 sites you could go to. But also they'll do for your apps. What they also do is movies and books. If you have a question about something that comes out, it will tell you the level. Third grade, you're not there yet, but by fifth grade, your kids could be entering into an interest of books that you might want to know whether there are plots to the story that really might be too mature. My argument is, I know a fifth grader can read the world, words of little women. They know nothing about love and should not be reading the book. There's nothing bad in it. They're just too young. And that site will tell you that sort of thing. But the, I mean, I'll talk about swear words and a lot of other things. So you don't need that yet, I don't think, at third grade. But as your kids get older, it's a one site. You can do it for every single thing. Reading, movies, um, apps, math. They've got a great site. So that's, we like to be able to give you one place to go. And I got one, can I ask one more question? I am doing a drop-in for fractions next Sunday morning for fourth and fifth grade. Do you think you would come? I don't know whether to include third grade or not. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science at third grade. I mean, I'd be glad to prepare it. So last time we did a drop-in, it's just that I create another pamphlet of math to practice, and I put up charts. I don't do any teaching because I've got three grade levels there. I did it for multiplication and division earlier in the year. It was third, fourth, and fifth. Just don't know whether to include third grade or not. Part of it's kind of like no harm, no foul. I might as well do it. So you'll be receiving another invitation for next Sunday. It is not a repeat of this, but it would be a repeat of the type. It would be more of the word problems. It's be the, yeah. So those it's for those of you who just want a little bit more practice, a little bit. But as I said, I won't be teaching. <laughs> more of a comment. So you say five to six weeks on every unit? You no. Not every. No. Because we just finished the area then, if we're starting this in third grade, and I feel like the kids, I'm just talking to moms from different classes, it, it seems like the kids are not grasping area as much as I thought they would. So I don't know if it's because they're not spending enough time on that unit, maybe it's worth doing something more with the area. They're confused a little. I mean, um. How do I say this without getting myself in trouble? There, there is a hierarchy of what's important in third grade. In areas, it's not the little brother. Because they're getting it's frustrated a, doing ISL, and, and they get it, but then they don't get it. Yeah. And um, the area is a shorter unit. It's just, like it's, it's another way of representing the multiplication. It's to extend the idea of what it is. It's not a major Fractions are, so so that's what I kind of had to say to the teachers that you need to stop this unit that you're in because this one is so important. It is more important. Yeah, fractions are more important. The multiplication and division itself, that understanding, yeah. absolutely. But the area know. represents it, okay. but it takes it off to, to that that other level. Is anybody in here in, in Mrs. I don't know what she goes by. Was it? Megan Porter. She took her kids into a real room that's L-shaped and said, how would you measure it? So it's that sort of real life 
Um, they'll be getting a lot more of it as, as they progress through the years. Thank you. You're welcome to your practice tricks. <laughs>